Okay, so we've been talking about power struggles. If um, you ha haven't heard the last three weeks, you're, you, you might be a little bit confused about some of this stuff, but um, the, all, all those videos are available online on our uh, Facebook, on the church's Facebook account. Um, okay, so power struggles are really about being dominant over others, trying to, ta trying to dominate over someone else. That's what the root of any power struggle is. Um, for instance, if you don't like how your spouse is doing something and you're trying to get them to do it your way, so there's a power struggle, right? If you don't like uh, how the church is doing and so you start butting your head with the leadership or the trees, uh, <laughs> you start butting your head with the, uh, it was the tree, I, I swear, it started it. Uh, you start butting your head with the, with the church leadership, it's a power struggle. You're, you're trying to dominate over someone else. Another example would be, um, if you don't like how your boss is doing something, it, the, what, what's in us is that we want to argue with them and we want to fight them on it when they're the one who's paying us, so we just kind of have to do what they want us to do. <laughs> See what I mean? We don't, power struggles are always that, that, that conflict that arises between who's going to be do dominant, who's going who's gonna to rule over the other one. And uh, if you remember, we br I brought this up, I believe it was um, in part one, but uh, this is just kind of a key part of understanding when you go into a power struggle and you're having conflicts with people, it doesn't matter who it is, just remember the simple concept that it is, it's really about pride because you're trying to dominate over someone else. If you were perfectly humble, you would never have power struggles ever. <laughs> but did you know that none of us are perfect like that? We're just, we're just not. You see Jesus, for instance, he comes to earth, you know, and, and he's completely submitted to the Father. Completely submitted to the Father. And he's not less of a person, he's not less of God, but yet he's still submitted to the Father. You know, and then you see the Holy Spirit kind of doing a similar thing with Jesus. And so you have this whole uh, submission thing among God himself. You know, and, and so God doesn't have to dominate over himself because he's humble. You know, which throws me away because I'm like, how can God be humble? And it's like, well, he is. It's like, eh, that's very complicated, but that's how it is. Uh, people who oppose authority, and, and I'm just tying in a few ideas before we actually get going on to this, because these two statements that I'm making are kind of foundational for the rest of it. So power struggles are about dominating over somebody else. And the second thing I want to say is, people who oppose authority usually don't lead others very well. Um, not only that, but usually the people who follow them don't follow them with loyalty because they don't feel like the person's trustworthy. When someone is submitted to their authority, there's more of a flow, and it's easier to believe what the person says, to do what they say, that kind of stuff. I'll give you an example. Um, I knew a father who was having problems with his teenager listening and obeying when he himself was not submitting himself to the police, his boss, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. See what I mean? He, there was a broken flow of authority. Whenever there's, whenever there's, con whenever there's a power struggle and a conflict, it's going to filter down to those underneath you. Because remember what I said last week: everybody is under authority, and all authority is borrowed. Right? It's it's all borrowed. So if there's a break in that flow of authority, now p there will always be rebellious people. You're going to have kids who disobey you anyways because kids are rebellious. But with that being said, it will be worse when you. Does that kind of make sense? It will be worse when you don't do your flow. <laughs> so, okay, now that we've gotten those kind of ideas out, um, uh, people who oppose authority don't, don't lead well. Here's the thing. They usually tend to nitpick instead of serve. You know, Jesus came to serve, not to nitpick. He didn't come in and just start nitpicking things. Now, he did correct. There's a difference there, okay? He did correct, like the Pharisees and that kind of stuff, but he didn't nitpick. Nitpick is where nothing anybody does is good enough. You know, you always, ha you always have pointers to give them. Somebody does their best, and you're like, that's not good enough. Um, you see a lot of, um, in a lot of businesses, you see this happen where the boss kind of feels like he has to isolate himself into his office, and any time that anybody does something, that he kind of feels like he has to give like the 20 things to, so that way they'll be more and more efficient. You know, yeah, they do the same kind of marketing at Walmart or at McDonald's, you know. If, if we just spurge them on for, or forward, they'll work better. Well, no, then they'll just work, goof off behind your back is what they'll do, because <laughs> there's no loyalty there. Um, but so that's what we're talking about tonight, power struggles. Now, just these are the th remember I said every single week we're going to look at the four important questions you have to ask in any power struggle. The last three, week one or part one, what do I control? Um, then part two, who has God given me? Part three, what am I obligated to do? And at the end we'll look at how these um, have kind of tie them all together at the end. But for right now let's kind of focus just on this. So the fourth question, 
how would Jesus lead? It is, it's going to happen. You're going to be in leadership somewhere. You might say, well, I'm never going to be a pastor. Well, you, you don't have to be a pastor for, the, for these things to apply. Everybody is under authority. You know, a wife is under authority. A husband is under authority. Kids are under authority. Everybody is under authority. You can't escape it. You know, you have to pay taxes, for instance. Why? Because we have <laughs> that authority. <laughs> so I hope you kind of see what I'm saying here. Everybody's under authority. But so that means eventually you will lead. So if you're going to lead, how should you lead? Well, you should lead how Jesus would lead. So how would Jesus lead? Okay, well, now we're getting down to something. First off, with good character. Now, before I get into the specifics, I want to look at Galatians. It says in chapter 5, verse 22 through 25, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against things, such things, there is no law. Now, when I first got married, somebody um, who was just kind of a, a problem person, you know, going around starting fights everywhere they went. You, you know the kind of person I'm talking about. Uh, they came up and they, said, they asked me a question. I said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my wife about that. And then they said, oh, be a man. Make up for... And I, was, and I said, well, hold on. It's not being a man to make up the decision without asking my wife and then make her do what I decided. That's not being a man. You, calm down there. What you're trying to do is you're trying to cause a conflict between me and my wife because we're having a conflict. And I don't want to take our conflict and transmit it to us. That's just not how this thing's going to work. Uh, but anyways, uh, now those who belong to, Jesus, uh, to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So the desire to be number one, the desire to be noticed for everything, the desire to dominate over other people. Good examples. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And we'll stop there in Galatians. Um, so that was Galatians 5, 22 through 25. And so I think in these verses, we kind of see a glimpse of what it means to lead with good character. See, what I brought up last week, and I, and I think I want to bring it up again, is Oftentimes we read verses and they sound like good verses, but we don't really apply them to our life. So we're, there's just like this chunk of knowledge that we have. Okay, I read my Bible, but you, we never stop to say, okay, now what does that have to do with me? What does that have to do with the situation that I'm in? So let's just ask a few questions of this. First off, you can see that being a man is not about losing your control or storming around and a huff and a puff. It's not about having no emotions. It's not about any of those things. Being a man is shown in love, joy, peace, patience. That's being a man. This is also what it means to be a woman of good character. See, there's been this artificial idea going around that to be a man, you have to be one of these big husky men that you just, oh, I lift weights and I, I chew my tobacco and I swallow it instead of spit it out. And it's like, okay, yeah. that's not really my standard of being a man. And when we look at the Bible, we see a lot of things that kind of go against what we've always heard. You know, um, here, I'll give you an example. I went to college with this guy, and he said that he, um, it was either crocheted or knitted. I don't remember which. I, I kind of have a hard time remembering which is which. And people uh, in the dorm were making fun of him that he was gay and that kind of stuff. He wasn't, by the way, but they were calling him that and whatnot. And, uh, you know, I was talking to him afterwards, and I said, y you know, back in the Back in the West, cowboys actually had to learn how to sew their stuff because they were out on the ranch and they kind of had to fix their stuff. They couldn't. <laughs> so, so I, I, with that being said, it's not, it doesn't make you a woman to sew any more than it makes you a man to know how to shoot a gun. You know what I mean? Like it's just, those things don't follow. And there's a lot of things that we're told about what makes us a man and what makes us a woman that just aren't really true. And one thing that we're told that makes us a man is Men, it's okay for men to lose their anger. It's okay for us to stomp around and to hit things and uh, no. No, that's, that, that's not okay. It, it, it's manly like to make, all, make up all the decisions in your, in your household and never consult your wife on anything. Well, I could be wrong, but I think this kind of contradicts that. I don't really see Jesus being the kind of dude that would just walk in and just be like, here's what I'm doing, and that's because I said so. In fact, we see that time and time again that he didn't do that. So he led by example, showing us that that's not how we as men should lead our households, and it's not how women should act. You know, so this is, this is how we should act. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. So what we see here, one of the things we see is patience. Let's ask a very, very important question with just this idea of patience. I know it said a lot of things, but let's just go with the idea of patience there right here, after peace. Am, as, I, as a father, am I being patient with my kids? See, take what you read, now apply it. Am I being patient with my kids? See what I mean? 
Stop and ask yourself questions. I'll, I'll give you a really good example of how I applied this verse. One time I wake up. Oh, man, this was, this was dreadful. I wake up and I hear a... <laughs> I rose to see what was the matter. <laughs> and so I go to the other side of the house because I'm hearing something fiercely bad. And I'm like, oh, dear goodness, what's going on? So I walk in. It's like 5 in the morning or something. I don't know. It's, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that that time shouldn't exist, whatever time it was. So I go... And I see my son filling up buckets of water from the bathroom and taking them into his bedroom and pouring them into different things. And then I see his sister, Freya wasn't, wasn't there. Um, <laughs> she wasn't there yet. But uh, so his, his, his sister Teresa is in there. <laughs> and she's helping him like, look, at, we're doing a good job. Now, <laughs> it didn't just stop there. They got things off down from the shelves. There was stuff in the toilet and the sink. I mean, think about it, and they did it. So this is a good example of what I... Now, what did I do? Now, what you think I probably did is you think I went in there yelling and screaming like I didn't. This is what I did. I went, <sighs> okay, crazy. It's not a big deal. It's all right. And then we started cleaning it. Patience. Now, why did I do that? Because I had just read this, and I was very concerned... <laughs> that God would say, I told you what to do. <laughs> I was like, ah. <laughs> uh, here's, another, here's another question. Am I being patient as a worker? You know, if, if, if you've ever worked, <laughs> you know that sometimes your boss or your coworkers can be very annoying. Are you being patient as a worker? So, I mean, at, read the text and actually ask, am I doing these things? Another example of, of uh, being patient, you don't know my wife. She's impossible to understand. Did you know that the ancients believed that their wives were impossible to understand too? Let me give you proof. 1 Peter 3, 7, You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way. Well, I can't understand her. You can't understand women. Live with them in an understanding way. Didn't, didn't you just hear what I said though, Peter? You can't understand them. They, they just don't make any sense. Live with them in an understanding way. Did I stutter here? It's like, ah, man. And show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. In other words, God will not hear the prayers of a husband who mistreats his wife. That blows my mind, man. She sh Have you guys ever seen the Goofy movie? Under your thumb, Goof. <laughs> you know? That's what we're told as men. We have to keep our women in line. You give them an inch, she'll take a mile. And then when you get older, it's like, oh, that's not actually biblical tr biblically true. It says to submit yourselves one to another. You as the husband are to sacrifice your life, yourself, for your wife. And the wife is supposed to submit herself to you. So if both of you guys are mutually submitting yourselves in those ways, you'll have a fulfilled marriage. If you have one person trying to dominate over the other one, you'll have an unfulfilled marriage. Because there's not really a respective person there. See, So that's a good example of, of what I'm talking about. So learn and do better. This is called patience. <laughs> and I will say this, you should be more patient with your wife than anyone else in your life. You should be more patient. Now, see, this is hard for me because I get home from a bad day of work, and the first thing I want to do is chew Gracie out for the smallest thing because I'm tired, right? But it's the other way around. We should show our wife the most amount of patience, more than we show other people. Now, see, that's hard. That's hard <laughs> because you have to get rid of your crappy little attitude so that when you come home, it doesn't go on to her, who's not responsible for your bad attitude, by the way. You are responsible for your own bad attitude. Like, for instance, wives, if, you, if your kids have been in a pain in the butt all day, that's not your husband's fault. Taking it out on him when he gets home, that's just as wrong as him coming home and bringing his crap home. There has to be mutual respect there, or else it's not going not gonna to work. Okay. Um, but I will give you guys some quick pointers that I read in a book that was actually very helpful to me. It's basically how to respond to your wife. And I'm just going to read through them. If she's nagging you, do it the first time she asks and she won't nag you. If she's in a bad mood, help her around the house and she'll probably get in a better mood. If she's being moody, try to encourage her, notice her, praise her for the little things, the big things, praise her for her looks, show you care. Don't wait five months to do what she asks you to do. See, wives do this thing, which I think isn't fair. But that's probably because I'm not a woman. 
They do this thing where they'll ask you to do something, and then they'll never bring it up again because they want to see if you were listening the first time. It's like, dang it, woman. Can't you just tell me like a hundred times? Well, then I'm nagging. It's like, that's true. Y- you, got, you got me there? That's true. That, yeah, yeah, you, okay, all right. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. She's asking a hundred questions. Well, if you communicate with her, she won't have to ask a hundred questions. And I will say this. This is a key way of knowing what your biggest leadership flaws are by listening to your wife's complaints because she sees you as a leader 24-7. It's not the facade that she sees. She sees the real you. If you want to know what your biggest weaknesses are, look at what your wife is complaining about, and you can be a better leader. That's, that's fact. You can take that to the bank. Um. If she's being overly critical, stop and listen to what, to what she's saying rather than having to fight back or, you know, to prove her wrong or to somehow squash her. You know, oh, well, she was being mean to me, so I really had to get her under my, under my thumb. Here's the thing. We as men, and women too, but we as men are supposed to be like Christ. And when our wives show us areas that we are not being like Christ, the proper response is to say, God, show this to me. Help me to grow from this. Not, not so that you can tell your wife that you did it for her. No, I know. So that you can be more like Jesus. That should be our goal, not, not so that we can get our wife to stop nagging us, but so we can be more like Jesus. That's the goal of being a Christian. And I, uh, just a few more things about that. How you affect your, your spouse, this goes for men and women, however you sp- affect your spouse will impact every area of your life. Every area of your life. Women, if you never learn to, to, to submit to your husband, what's going to happen is you're going to have power conflicts with everybody. Husbands, if you don't learn at, at the home how to respect her and how to love her like that, you, you notice that he's going to go off into other areas. When you abuse your, your authority and you mistreat your authority in one area, not only does God start to bring conviction on you and you won't sleep as good, you won't pray as good, but then also... He'll bring other areas by to challenge that problem. You'll have start having problems at work, for instance. You'll start having problems at church. Until you learn how to deal with your wife, those problems won't go away because it goes out. Okay? That's basically from Genesis, uh, the, beginning, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, where it talks about how when a husband and wife get married, they become one flesh. So what, anything that you do in that bond is going to come back on you, basically. And that's important to know because if you want to fix the problems you're having at work or at church, fix the problems you're having at the home, and it'll follow. Strong marriages make strong families, make strong churches, make strong nations. And uh, just another side note, how you treat your mom will usually be how you treat your wife. Once again, that, that authority line. If you as a kid don't learn how to treat your mom, then when you go to get married, it'll rub off there. I'm just trying to help you see the big picture of, of that. Uh, another thing um, that's kind of in, in this but not, not necessarily specifically were, uh, mentioned is the idea of humility. And uh, I don't want to get too much into what humility is, but basically um, being able to be taught is a good definition of humility. And uh, there are two specific warning signs that God gives us that I really want to want to mention. The first is children's character flaws. Children's character flaws. Children are like bas- basically giant sponges, and when you do so- do something that's very um, not good continually, it will start affecting their behavior, and then it'll make it harder for you to parent. Does that kind of make sense? So if you want to see some of your biggest flaws, look at how your children are developing, and then that will help you to to grow more. Don't guilt trip yourself. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, and then the, then the second area that God shows us, um, that God gives us little warning signs before he brings by troubling problems are with our spouse. What has your spouse been criticizing you for lately? These little things are ways that God gets your attention through your spouse, and if you don't listen, he'll bring bigger situations by. And eventually, you will listen, because <laughs> God doesn't skip over tests. He's like, okay, well, we're going to take the scenic route on this test, evidently. So, uh, you know, sometimes if your children are lazy, it could be because you're pushing them too hard. Sometimes we as parents demand too much of our kids. That can cause them to go backwards and be lazy instead. Sometimes our kids are lazy because we don't do anything around the house and they just assume that that's okay to not do anything. 
th- this see this gets kind of tricky because we as men we, we we go off or if you if you're a woman who works outside of the house we go out and work and then we come home and we want we want to relax but then all of our all our kids see are as being lazy so then they copy that behavior by not doing anything around their house why didn't you clean up after yourself why didn't you clean up after yourself so you, so you leave your crap laying around and then when your kids do the same thing it's like oh no and you've broken a cardinal rule and it's like well See how God uses our kids to show us our faults. And it's the same thing with our spouse. In fact, I will say this. Watch out for the things in your spouse that annoy you the most. Because that's probably where you need to be more like Christ. Be more understanding. Figure out why they're acting like that. And then change your behavior accordingly. Did you hear me say change your wife accordingly? Change your behavior accordingly. And that goes for men and women. So don't think that I'm being sexist here. I'm not. Um. Now, what men do, before I go on, what men do is we always ask this question. You keep mentioning my wife. Well, what about her? You keep mentioning what I need to change. What about her? It's that exact point that I'm making. A man asks that because he's prideful. You know what happens when you tell a wife what they're doing wrong? They just believe you. And then they start trying to change themselves to make you happier. I don't know why they do that. It's like, fight me back, woman. I'm yelling at you. You're supposed to yell at me back. What men do, however, is the exact opposite. When, a, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when, when people start telling us how we should be a better husband or father or whatever, we start putting up the barrier. Well, you should be telling my wife, too. What about her? It's that attitude of pride that's keeping us from being more like Jesus. It's not about what's fair. It's about how can I show more of Christ so just a few things here. Oh, I think that I uh, gave the computer a little bit of a brain fart. Did I, did I do something, Benny? Okay. Um, <laughs> you don't know, huh? Okay, well, I'll just keep going. Um, if you take the mouse, Dad, take the mouse, hover it over the PowerPoint icon at the bottom, on the taskbar, and then select the right panel. No, 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 no. The, the, the PowerPoint um, on the taskbar, the, the PowerPoint logo, put your mouse over that. And then there'll be two, ta- two windows that open up. Click on the right one. Did you do it? Aha, there you go. Uh, so, um, how would Jesus lead with good character? We looked at that. The second thing, besides with good character, now, I, I really want you to get these, so I, I, if I'm going too fast on these next two, make sure to stop me, because I really want you to get that. So, with good character, as if for God, that's the second way that Jesus would lead. Now, for instance, if you look at Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. This doesn't just apply to marriages. I'm talking about Christians in general, not, not married people, Christians in general. The idea of sacrificing yourself for someone else's well-being. Now we looked at this. We looked at this last week in Philippians chapter uh, two, verses three-ish, somewhere around there, three through five, maybe somewhere in there. And uh, it was basically talking about the idea of putting others first. And this just really kind of builds on that: the idea of dying to yourself, put others' needs before your own. That's how Jesus would have done it. In fact, that's how Jesus did do it. Most of what Jesus did in this world was not for his own benefit. The only way that, God, that Jesus benefited in that and the way, is the way that um, he got a bride, us, the church, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> like, there really wasn't a whole lot in it for him. Um, for instance, you see Jesus going uh, when he's 12 to the, to the temple. He, he, he could have started building up his ministry there. I know, you know, kids do that with their faith healing, for instance. <laughs> so Jesus could have done that, but instead he submitted to his parents. That wasn't for his best interest. Well, I guess it was because God was able to use work through that as a testament to other people. But it, it was mostly for, the, for our benefit, who would follow afterwards. Um, another another uh, way that we, we can do it as if for God. When you make financial decisions, if you're married, do you make it with your spouse? Or do you make financial decisions by yourself? If you're single, now get this. People think if I'm single, I can spend my money however. Eh, bad idea. Because we always err under the side of selfishness. If you are single, obviously 
you, you can't take it to your spouse, but I would highly encourage you to find some kind of an accountability person who will help you to manage your money wisely um, because Amazon wish lists too often get moved into the shopping cart and those too often get moved into the checkout cart and those too, too, too often end up at your house. So if you just find accountability groups or, or something like that um, to manage your money, it will really help with that. Um, another thing uh, parents do this is with, with parenting. They, there was maybe like one's doing it, but the idea is that both are doing it. If you're married, your life decisions should be made together. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Okay, hold on. As to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. That is how you should be doing things. So the idea here, do it as if you're doing it for God. Do the best you can. That's what makes it do, do... When I say, when you hear me say, do it with excellence, that means do it the best that you are able to do it. You know what I mean? Sometimes we, we gauge our performance by somebody else. I'm doing better than them. That's not your standard. Oh, I'm not doing as good as them. That's not your standard either. Are you doing the best that you can do? That's the standard. It says, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Doing it from your heart. And obviously that, that means you can't do it with complaints. It's really hard to do something from your heart if you're doing it with complaining. Um, so then the third area, that how would Jesus lead? You know, we're looking at power struggles. You have to lead like Jesus when you do have power. So the three things, with good character, as if for God. The last thing, with others. Jesus would lead with others. We have this idea that to be a good leader, you have to do it solo. Lone wolf. Don't question my authority. My thought, huh? That's not really how it works. <laughs> That's really not how it works. Uh, there are three specific people that Jesus not only would use, but actually you see it happen in the gospel. The first are helpers. Helpers, the, these are people who come alongside of you to help you do the task. Okay, A good example of this would be in Luke chapter 10, verse 1. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. This is a good example. Helpers. Jesus needed help. Okay, now remember, Jesus is, is our model. Jesus needed help. Do you think you need help? So let me see how this applies. First off, as a parent, read books. It's okay to read books. You don't have to read every book in, on parenting in the world. But maybe read some books to kind of freshen up your mind. Uh, do you work in, in a place of business? Read books on how to do it better. Listen, listen to radio or podcasts or something to help you improve your skills. It's okay to be better at something than you were yesterday. That's okay. You, can, you don't have to say, well, I've been doing this for 50 years, so I'm not going to change at all. Well, that's not really a good attitude to have. You're either growing or you're dying. You might as well grow since you're here. I mean, why waste your time? Um, so the first group of people that Jesus would have is helpers. The second group, I'm going to call these mentors. These would be like, um, well, like the books that I mentioned, the podcasts that I le mentioned, um, fellow leaders. Um, but overall, these kinds of people are at a higher caliber than you. They are at a level of success or maturity or age, not necessarily age, maturity and success that you want to be. Don't pick people who are at the same level as you. Find somebody who's a better parent a better leader, a better husband, somebody who, who, who's done more than you have. Don't find somebody who's your peer. Find somebody who's better than you at what you're doing. And then get under them and learn from them. See, when we're young, we learn to do this. We learn from our parents, and then we have apprenticeships or something like that. You know, okay, these are good things. But then as we get older, we just kind of forget that we're supposed to be growing and refining our skills. So we kind of just stagnate, and that's just not healthy. John 5.19 says this, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of God can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. This would be a good example of Jesus' mentor, God the Father. Now, obviously, um, the rules are a little bit different than us. You need, you need some, 
some human mentors. <laughs> Don't pull the whole God card like, oh, God's my mentor. Okay, that's fine. Read the Bible. That's great. But also have some human mentors too. So just throwing that out there. And then the third group uh, that I want to mention that, that, that we need to get help with as we, as we lead, try to lead our best, is what's called advisors. Now, these are people where they're thinkers. Okay, helpers help us do it. Advisors help us think it. See the difference there? Sometimes you're going to find people in your life that are real good at doing things, but they're not real good at thinking things through. And then sometimes you're going to run into people who they can think like crazy. They can think every single um, possible thing that could possibly go wrong. But they're just not great at doing things. And then sometimes you meet that rare person who's great at both. Grab this person to your team. Grab this person to your team. Run stuff by them, absolutely. Um, and with advisors, what should we do and how? Sam Chand says it like this. Here's my idea. Make it better. He has an idea. He takes it to his advisors, and he says, this is my idea. Fix it. Find every single possible weakness. Make it better. See, what we do oftentimes as leaders is we think we have to have all the answers to be a leader. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. To be a good leader, you need to be a good learner. To be a good leader, you need to be a good servant. In Matthew chapter 20, uh, I'm sorry, not chapter 20, chapter 17, verse 19, it says, Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not drive it out? What was wrong here? What, what, what went wrong with our game pattern? Take your idea, take it to your advisors. Now, in this case, it's the many consulting the one. Usually advisors, there's many for the one to consult. So just roll with it. You kind of see the principle there and, and don't really worry about the specific there. Um, so we're just going to close out and look at a few more things. Well, I don't want to go with that. Um, there are things and people in life that you don't like. And no matter how much you like, they will always rub you the wrong way. That's just going to happen. Uh, not just situations, people too. Um, you can fix your attitude, but you can't ever change them. And as a Christian, you should definitely fix your attitude. So before you get too carried away with yourself, like, well, they're the problem. Well, that's fine, but your attitude stinks. Because remember, your crappy little attitude is kind of like, have you ever been on a lo long road trip where the, where the wind windows are rolled up and somebody bus wind? Man, oh, man, it's like something died in there. Oh, man, it's terrible. And you can't leave because you're going like 80 miles an hour. That's what a bad attitude does. It just stinks up everybody. And we don't, oh, no, I, I, I'm fine. But everybody else in the car is thinking, no, you're not. You need to see a doctor. <laughs> There's something going on inside of you that's not good. And that's exactly what a bad attitude does. When you've got a bad attitude, it's not good. It's not okay. You need to go get that fixed. <laughs> no, don't pull their finger anymore. No more. <laughs> Spend less time trying to prove you are in control and more time trying to be like Christ. That's how you lead well. That's how you lead well, by spending less time trying to prove that you are in control and more, try, more time trying to be like Christ. When you go into these problems and you, you don't know how to lead, ask this very simple question. What would Jesus do? How would Jesus lead in this situation? You will be in some situations where there's nothing you can do right. Everything you do, everything you say will be wrong. It will blow up in your face and there's nothing you can do about it. That's going to happen sometimes. However, you can still do the right thing even though it won't give you a good outcome. See what, I, see what I mean? And then those tricky situations that are all gray and no black and white, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. This is what Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 to 28 says. But Jesus <clears throat> called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great, I'm sorry, and their great uh, men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. See, we read that, but then we say, Okay, so as a father, I need to pound my kids straight. No. As a husband, I need to pound my wife straight. No. As a Christian, I need to set my authority because people, if I don't assert myself, people will step all over me. People are going to step all over you anyways. It doesn't matter. Don't worry about that kind of nonsense. It is not the way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is an attitude that you have in yourself. And it has to reach into every arena of your life, be it at work, be it personal, be it ministry, it doesn't matter. It has to reach inside of you to such an extent that it changes how you think. 
It changes how you deal with things. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So the four lessons from the four questions, I remember at the beginning we looked at the four questions to ask in every power struggle. These are the four lessons that we, that we learned from those questions. Question, I mean, uh, um, lesson number one, do it with good character. I'm sorry, there. Where is it? There it is. Lesson number one, let it go. Learn to let it go. You're not in control of everything. You're not in control of everything. Learn to let it go. That was the first part one. The second lesson that we learned, appreciate the irritating. When things are there that you can't fix, you can't get rid of, learn to appreciate it and grow from it. Because you can't get rid of it anyways. I mean, Give your best effort. That was last week. What, what, remember, we, looked, we asked the question, what, what am I required to do? What's the bare minimum that I have to do? Give your best effort. And so this one, the, the lesson that we learned from this fourth and final question, lead like Jesus would lead. When you're in a power struggle and you, ha you are in control, you are the one who's, who's the leader in the situation, lead like Jesus would. Don't try and constantly assert yourself as the man of the house or the whatever. Don't worry about that kind of nonsense. Do it as Jesus would do it. Now, I don't know what all this stuff was. I, feel, I have a feeling that I, I, I put it there for a reason. But, you know, like most things I do, I have no idea why I did it. I'm just joking, just joking, just joking. Um, and I will say this. Uh, this is the, the final, final, final point for the final series of the final lesson, all that stuff. Okay, this is the absolute final thing, I believe. Let me double check. Yep, it's the final. How you deal with power struggles in your life, because you will have power struggles in your life, how you deal with them will build bridges into other people's lives. You, you want to you touch other people's lives? You want to help show them Jesus? Handle power struggles well. If you're one of those people who's always trying to get a one-up over someone else, you're not going to be a very good witness to other people. It's not going to happen. Then you're going to try and build into their life, and they're just going to reject you. Flat out, they're going to reject you. But if you really, really, really want to show Jesus, you want to be a light to people, handle power struggles well. Learn to let things go so that when everybody else is stirred up about politics or whatever else, your attitude is good because you've learned to let it go. See what I mean? Take the things that I've learned over the, uh, that I that I have learned that I've put into these lessons over the past couple of weeks and think about them. I, 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 well, I guess I should stop there. So, um, there comes a point when we just need to pray. Uh, Lord.